and ready or not, welcome back to another edition of Grumpy Science with yeah. Bob and Mark. Howdy. Well, you know, where we spend at least 15 minutes making a 16-minute video. <laughs> Jibber, jibber jabbered about nothing. <laughs> so nothing we'll, but our anger. A couple, of, couple of updates here. We're still playing the stroke card pretty heavily. What stroke? Oh, yeah. Anytime we anytime we have some application due, I always tell people, well, Bob had a stroke, so we won't be able to get this yeah, in on right. time. Uh, I'm more than 100% <laughs> recovered, really. <laughs> and um, we can actually measure it. We actually measure him several times, the brain yeah. gauge, and he's recovering nicely. Uh, as nicely as I can do he, anything. As nicely as he can get back to normal. <laughs> Though we know we, we both know we weren't. Neither of us can claim normalcy. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I'm headed back toward normal. That would not be normal for me. So. Anyway, yeah, if we were headed back to normal, we wouldn't be doing the show. That's right. Uh, We'd be doing something <laughs> completely different. Yeah. So well, we... you know, we had some news updates. Uh, one is on oh. the uh, the saga of the administrator who was putting his foot down on the brain gauge oh, yeah. by, and what he did was, you know, this was okay. Picture this: we have a like a department of medicine, or a department of actually radiology, or department of surgery. This well, anyway, I'll just I'll, we'll something. change the names to protect the the guilty. Anyway. One of the chairs of these departments wanted to buy a brain gauge, and they had a an account with lots of money in it, many times more money in it than than the was necessary to buy a brain gauge, and so they put the request through purchasing, where purchasing was going to go out and they were supposed to just submit it, you know, where they were supposed to buy it. Well, uh, you know, if you bought a brain gauge, you know, it's not real difficult. You you go online, you buy, and it comes in the mail the next day. And that's actually what uh, the, the process was taking so long. That's actually what one of the doctors at this particular institution did. He went ahead and bought his own. And uh, well, he was filling me on, on, on the delay for the institutional brain gauge. And uh, the head of purchasing, who happened to be a lawyer, decided they would have to write a proposal to him, a scientific proposal that he did not have the qualifications to evaluate. To read, yeah. And But he said he would approve it. Well, the day after he got the proposal, or the day he got the proposal, he's, he announced that he was quitting and going to another university. Efficient, <laughs> efficient use of, of time. So, after so he had delaying, a bunch of scientists spending their time writing a scientific report for him that he was not qualified to read, and that when it was delivered to him in a timely way, he just up and left. <laughs> yeah. Typical. Typical. Did I ever tell you the story about uh, my problem with uh, purchasing at University of Michigan um, when I was trying to buy polarizers, optical no. polarizers. Well, they did the same thing. So they had this whole policy. Well, we're going to save the university a lot of money because we're going to help these stupid scientists, you know, find the best price for what they need because they don't know how to buy things, you know. So um, I was a graduate student working on uh, designing a new kind of microscope, actually, where I had to have an optical polarizer, which is sort of like a little dark gray piece of plastic which you can use to polarize light um, and uh, they're not very expensive couple dollars and I, I placed an order for one and I had this purchasing this old guy who'd been doing purchasing for 20 hours <laughs> and he's gonna teach me how to buy something at a reasonable price right so he sat me down and said well here son give me give me your specs and I'll look around and I'll find a good one now this was in 1991 1991. So no, no a number of back years. Then. No, this, is, <laughs> this was in 1991. But the saga continues. You'll see. So, so I, you know, I was a graduate student. I didn't have any any horsepower at the university. I couldn't make the guy do his job. Turns out, I now know as a faculty member, nobody can make university administrators do their job <clears throat> very often because they don't have jobs to do. So they have to make things up. But this guy actually took my order, took the specs that I had, did not authorized to order them from where I had specified. <clears throat> he went ahead and put them out for bid. You know, I think it was a dollar ninety. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you, I kept were you up getting with them. two or three of them. I was I was getting a little pack of, of sort of used ones, you know, sort of leftover <laughs> ones. So anyway, I, I knew where this was headed, right? I could smell it already. So I just went ahead and pulled two bucks out of my pocket and ordered them back in nineteen ninety one. I finished my dissertation, graduated, went on to, you know, Different things, I wouldn't say better things, <laughs> and you know, different problems at different universities. 
And anyway, so I, I kind of kept on this guy every year or two. You know, hey, have you have you found a better price for those yet? And this was in 1991. And to this day, this is 2018, he still hasn't found <laughs> He still hasn't found the best price for two dollars worth of plastic polarizers. And that could I have made that up? Yeah, probably, but I didn't. That's a true story. That's a true story. So he will retire, never having found a better price. And he could have saved if he could have gotten them for free. He could have saved the university almost two dollars. Almost possibly. How many man hours went into that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've put many hours into just calling them up just for. For grins, you know, hey, you got those polarizers yet? Oh, let me let me dig through my records and see. That's a true story. Okay, cool. Administrators, very so, cool. So we won't we won't complain about administrators the entire time. Why so, not? Why, why, why not? not? It's so much fun. It's so oh, much fun. but we will promise that uh, one of the key players in the the ongoing saga of yeah. the Brain Gauge purchase at this university, oh, yeah. uh, one of the key players agreed to be interviewed. And he's we're going to have another <laughs> grumpy scientist. <laughs> Trust me, grumpy scientists are not hard to find. Yeah. You just have to know where to look. A good place to start is any university. Which, you know, and if you have a story to tell, either of our viewers has a story to tell, uh, email yeah. us. Both and, of you are welcome yeah. to email us. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll tell your story. As well as we can also, and I, I do know, I think a couple of our viewers are actually clinicians. And might have some case studies for us and might might, might like to talk about share some their stuff on there. Clinical insights. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so what are we talking about besides complaining well, about besides complaining about that? Did you know <laughs> did you know how that, that when if you were like most models of the uh, brain, like if, when you're modeling neural networks, they can be re reduced down to equivalent circuits. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what people say. Yeah. Or that's what I'm they say. I'm not 100% sure that you know, that's and, true. But, but those equivalent circuits are comprised of pretty much resistors and capacitors. And you know why people do this, right? And, you know why scientists pulses. do this to muscle and to nerves, peripheral nerves, all kinds of things? They reduce them down to electrical circuits because that allows them to not get their hands dirty and just sit down with a piece of paper <laughs> and do math. And 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 because and, because electrical circuits are well characterized mathematically, so they think they can actually do neuroscience by drawing little resistors and squiggly lines on a piece of paper. But anyway, my, my anyway, opinion. Anyway, well, and then you know we actually are nonsense, involved. We we do our own brand of neural network modeling and computational neuroscience. I didn't say your stuff actually... was nonsense. I just <laughs> you know in general it's nonsense. I mean, you know, what Mark does is really really <laughs> valuable. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it is, but anyway. So anyway, there's network. actually okay. a neural network component to the brain gauge, uh, mm -hmm. and that's how we we link um, uh, animal data to human data. Mm -hmm. And we spend a lot of time doing animal studies. And though even though PETA doesn't like to hear it, if it were not for animal studies, we would not know squat about measuring the brain. That is true. So um, speak. I'd like to make a comment about animal studies. I hate doing animal studies. I hate it. Just like I hate doing my taxes. More than I hate doing my taxes. But sometimes you have to as a scientist. I don't know. Do you know a single scientist who enjoys no. doing animal studies? I don't nobody, know anybody. Nobody does. enjoys it. So the it's weird thing about thing this whole the weird thing about this whole, you know, against animal testing thing is, you know, they tend to the people who are against it tend to make out like scientists enjoy doing this. It it is not something that anybody that I know enjoys doing, and if they did, they, there'd be something wrong with them. It's a, it's a terrible thing that we're we're forced to do because if we don't do it, we don't know anything. That's true. We don't don't know much. Anyway, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we know and how how some of the things are modeled. And I was trying to bring in the equivalent circuitry in because Bob but actually now he's, knows. I shamed him. So, so it's <laughs> because not Bob knows happen. a little bit about circuitry. Yeah, so I know we a little tiny bit Include about him it. his uh, expertise. I may actually steps. know something about what Mark's talking about this time. Here's here's our word of the day quiz. That there will be a quiz, and there it's is, right now. Or there should be a quiz today. We had a word of the day. We had this word of the day two months ago. Well. Who knows? We, we took a little summer. If you take a summer break now, off. Now, be honest. Do you remember what this word means? Well. 
Of because course, neither I, one I of us. Completely did. remember. I completely remember having a discussion about it. But then we talked we about it like we know what we're talking <laughs> about, which is you know what we do as scientists, and neither one of us could remember what the heck. <laughs> so we had to look it up. Yeah. I was just as surprised to see the definition the second time as well as the first time. Well, I figured but you my didn't remember. Is, you're, you had a stroke. And your excuse is... I'm just dumb. I had a stroke. Yeah. My excuse is Bob had a stroke, so I can't remember. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good excuse. We share it. You know, I, I loan that excuse out to people as they need it. Which is all the time. much more frequently than I thought. Yeah. We get, we get away with it. So... <laughs> So if you're modeling stuff, we can do block di is our block diagrams okay? Because we're so I'm good. okay with block. Di I'm okay you know, with modeling stuff. And I, I will be getting my hands dirty because I tend to get marker all over myself when I draw these things. <laughs> He's just like a little so, kid. I have a seven year old who's the same way. Look, Daddy, look what I draw on the wall. So we're gonna have to pull our multimedia center up a little closer. There we go. But you know, let's let's pretend that we're that. And basically, okay. So and this is also along the lines of, you know. I really do think, you know, you could probably build your own neural network that functions if you have all the right components. I tried to do that in graduate school, actually. <laughs> Crashed and burned. So I kind of quietly moved over to doing something else. I'm well, only saying bad things about I was, it because I'm a failure. I was right? just going to say, you know, so some people want to build their own <laughs> PEMF device and... Some people that I did not fail. Some people that I, that I succeed. You know, and one guy, it took you know, twenty years, but, uh, but I got for it. A guy from uh, a prominent local university came by my my office <laughs> one day, and oh, and, and before I got through, even he said he wanted to know what we were doing, so I started taking him through some slides. Oh, and after about guy. three slides, oh, well, this is easy. I I can just build my own. I'm like. Knock yourself out. Knock your so. bad <laughs> self out, brother. <laughs> yep. So DIY. Uh, There's some things where DIY means like 15 years of work in a laboratory. And generally, I we work with just about anybody. We have lots of collaborations around the world. But someone asked me the other day, do you work at such and such university? It's right next door. And I'm like, actually, we don't because, well, well, because they don't like us. They, <laughs> because, because we have bad attitudes. I, I think it's mostly your fault. It's girl. probably my fault. <laughs> it's a, I was just taking a guess. We have a policy. <laughs> if somebody says that they could build one fairly easily, we just say, Have at yeah, it, brother. Go Pat at it. on the back. Do it yourself. Firm handshake. So, anyway, now we, we... Good luck to you. We've generated... A, so this is going to have to lapse into... We'll do, we'll do We're going to do some science We'll now. do a little bit of science. Okay, you've paid your, you've paid your grumpy tax. <laughs> you pay, you now you get to see some science. Okay, well, I'm going to Draw try carefully. To, None of this uh, chicken scratch. Okay, crap. Yeah. Maybe I should have <laughs> you, you draw. Did you do it wrong already? No, I'm going to have you draw. I'm going to no, tell no, you what no, to no, draw. No, 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 I have a stroke. You had a stroke? Okay, you, you have I'm trying to draw. to draw an arrow here. Here's an arrow. I think you, you could probably do a lot better. How kind of an arrow is Can you draw a square? Yeah, I can see you draw, draw, draw a square right here. Is this a test? Am see, I he can use his right hand. First of all, this is having an arrow, backwards. Right? This should be an arrow. Right, now it's right. going. That's the input. It's going into a like a cylindrical a box. A box. Let's make it sort of cylindrical. Yeah, yeah that's good. Long enough. How's that? That's good. And now we're gonna have an output. Another arrow. Another arrow going out. Okay. Now this, we're just gonna use this to represent like one of the modules in the brain. And so what is a module? Or, what is a module? Well, a functional, a functional mo module. Now, we talk about this in terms of, you could think about this in terms of brain. You could say, well, if we have an input and an output, and we talk, this is basically kind of control theory boxes. So the input could be, I, I smash your thumb, <laughs> yeah. and the output would be, ouch. <laughs> okay? Right. But we want to get a little more detailed than that. So we, if you start at the bottom, the very bottom of this, uh, and you look at what's the functional units that, that work together, those are mini columns. And mini columns are about 35 microns in diameter. Uh, and then a bunch of those, you know, a bunch of cells that are about 20 microns in diameter cluster to make that one mini column. It's a, you know, it's a, an array of cells. And they work together. Well, they cluster up dynamically depending on what the inputs are to be a column. Those columns cluster up, depending on what's going on, uh, to become, uh, you know, an aggregate of columns. Then those things cluster up into different areas, different regions, whatever, and sort of a, basically a fractal organization. And there's all kinds of cool pictures of fractals on the Internet, which we're not going to try to reproduce. So what we're going to talk about is 
how do one of these modules interact? And this will, I generally think in terms of many columns and columns. So we need to draw another one to talk about how it interacts. Now we've got, one of the this same is, size. we can call this column one. Another and one of the same size? Yeah, same size, maybe a little further down, get a little more space. Oh, sorry. You're doing much better drawing than I do. This is really a good, I know, I don't know what's good the deal with separation that. of activities. Yeah, this is part of my skill set. Yeah. It's drawing. Okay, we, now we need an arrow in here because we got inputs coming into this one. And outputs coming from this one. Now, we've talked about concept of lateral inhibition before. So the output of this one comes back here. And sort of and minuses, and has right? a little negative sign on here. Right. So, gonna, so I can I can probably know. draw this. I'll draw. You want to draw in red? That's a great idea. Since here? it's inhibition, we should draw it in red. All right. So can I draw it like this? Sure. Well, okay. Actually, so one, output one, of here to the input of here. Output there to the input there. In input here. Oh, input here. All right. Well, we can actually. It's also an input there, but we, it's that's getting somewhere into this box. It's yeah. it's input into this box. It, these are this is negative. And this is a negative input. Okay, we also have negative input from here to here. Yep. All right. Draw that the same way. So that's going to go. Okay. Negative input. Now, yeah, he he put the arrow a little bit too high, so it's completely wrong, and it's going to mess up our analysis. But we'll let it ride. So <laughs> because because that's what I am. I'm a disruptor. <laughs> okay. So, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about are lateral inhibition. Lateral inhibition is that when both of these things get activity, and let's say let's give this one some input. Let's give it like three X's. Oops. Okay. Don't bend over, you got a stroke. That's right. I don't want to stroke out again, right? So this okay, one let's say there's like three pluses. Let's give this Two pluses. So we got three pluses coming into this input and two pluses coming into this module, module one, module two. So what's what's going on when you have activation here and activation there? And say it brings them both up to like, whoo, they're both active. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like stimulating both fingers. You stimulate one finger or you stimulate the other finger and they're both getting some levels of activity. Well, now what we want to do Let's define the inputs. Let's say what the input looks like just to get a time course on it. Can you drive a, draw a sinusoid? Or yeah, I, I guess I can. Sinusoid. No, you can. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to draw the sinusoid. What I want you to think about is we're going to think about, okay, here's what happens on the very first output. All right. right. Now let's look at the output. Well, actually, we want to look at the outputs of these two boxes. And what we want to do is for the output of these two boxes, let's put a graph here and a graph here. And we're going to do time points. So a graph, just put the axis here, you know, x and y axis. Okay. Good. Same thing here? Yep, same thing. So what we're going to draw on these two boxes is how much activity is going on in this module. And if you've got, let's say, we're, we're let's say these two entities are really close. And so we're going to put a levels here of how much activity you have after the first sinusoid. So for the, at the very beginning, you're going to get a little bit, yeah, put an output there. Okay. Yeah. And then somewhere here, you're going to have an output that's a little bit lower. A little bit lower. Because it's got a little lower input. Just too. a little lower input. And right. you might be able to tell the difference or you might not. Right. Okay. Now what happens on the second input? Well, on the first input, you're activating pyramidal cells, and you're activating all the stuff that gets active, and it's excited because this is a super threshold <laughs> stimulus, so it's sort of activating everything, and and you've got this whole bunch of stuff in the upper layers called the NMDA receptor system. Well, the NMDA receptors, they kind of yawn on the first one. They go, ah, okay, yeah, I'm no not interested. Response. They're voltage dependent, so they they they, they sort of wake up. But now we have a second stimulus. Now, what else is going on? What happens with this input and this input and this activity? What happens here? You're taking sort of a plus three and subtracting it from a plus two. So you expect this one to go down. Right. So this one on the second. Now, now when we get this, by the time we get to the second waveform, 
The activity here suppresses the activity here. Right. So the down next goes down a little bit lower. And this one stays the same. Doesn't go up any. But generally what happens is when you have when you're improving contrast, you're not turning up the brightness knob. You're yeah. actually turning down what's next door. Yeah. Now, on this second waveform, what's going on? NMDA receptors are going, okay, I'm, I'm getting interested. They're voltage right. dependent. So this is like 80 milliseconds into it. And so, by the way, the, the stuff we deliver on the brain gauge is highly precise. And we don't do product placement here, talking about the brain gauge. And, and you can always use the discount code GRUMPY to buy our products. But we never do that. So we're the above that. We're yeah. academics. <laughs> Ivory Tower stuff. Yeah. Trust me. And we just do, we only sell stuff to support our own research separate from what we're told is research. <laughs> right. So now let's look. Yeah, this is where it gets interesting. NMDA receptors, they get active. Okay, this excitation, maybe we can make that bump a little bit higher. Yep. So this one will bit up higher. a little bit higher. Because all the other receptors are like, okay, I believe you. There's, Meanwhile, there's more. There's three stimuli. And Did since it's more exciting, you have more suppression of this one. So this one goes down. Yeah, this one goes down. You, you may have to make this axis lower. Well, we'll, but we'll just go below the zero mark. Yeah. Well, and so by this third cycle, what's going on here is like this guy is like, it's really feeling pretty tough. And it's knocking the snot out of this guy because it's saying. This one starts off with an advantage, module one. It's got more input. Right. <clears throat> so it's, it takes off with itself. It's building up on its input, exactly. but its output is suppressing this module right. it's more powerfully than its input is driving it. So and initially, yeah, and initially <laughs> the input here, because this will be the first question we get, the input here initially does have a negative out, right. but it does suppress us a little bit, and that's why it takes a little bit longer. It keeps those NMDA receptors yawning and not mm -hmm. caring and a little bit longer, but and it, that is dependent on the initial condition. So initial conditions are, what's the initial input? And you take two stimuli that are very close together, and if you deliver the stimulus long enough on the next one, this is gonna, yeah, it's gonna start to peak. You know, let's just go ahead and fill mm -hmm. that in, sort of, sort of so we get one of those fancy sigmoidal exponential like that? growth curves. So it, look, it's, it's up to here. So it, it goes up, and that's kind of a nice function. Yeah, and that's not just a nice function that we've modeled. It's also a nice function we've seen. And down yeah. here, it goes down and then just flattens out because there is a minimum amount of activity. So sort of like that, kind of right? A little bit above zero. Right, and so when you when you look at it for real, it looks you know it's usually depending on the initial conditions. A lot of times you see one of these sigmoidal curves, and the reason I show that one of those S curves, that's the kind of thing they talk about in high school, but you never see. Sigmoidal means S-shaped. <laughs> yeah, you see it's scientific. Yeah, it's very scientific jargon, and it, and it scares people away. <laughs> yeah. So like anyway, to me, th this is kind of a really cool thing because we studied this in the animal, and then we modeled how we were going to deliver these different stimuli to two adjacent places on the skin and look at the time course. Now, we deliver a set time point because we get into this this flat section at the end of the stimulus thing. We could, you know, just look at here, but that's really boring. Mm -hmm. But basically what happens is... There's a dynamic interaction. Dyna these dynamic interactions cause this. But what happens is if you have a neurological disorder, a lot of neurological disorders will just say they're going to look just like this, no matter how long you stimulate. And rather than act activation in one region going up and activation in another region going down, there's nothing. Yeah, so it's a major major function of the brain. Yeah. To be able to to do this. Now we lateral, they, they may they condition. may not realize that we oversimplified the brain with these two block diagrams. But now what you want to do is imagine that this particular area of central uh, what do we call it central intelligence or, or central activation uh, <laughs> is surrounded by a bunch of areas of inhibition. And the, the more and more it happens, this is really dynamic. It keeps going and going and going, going up and up and up. Well, it's it's clearly stopped at a certain point. It doesn't get much higher, but all the surrounding areas are starting are pulling So down. basically, as you stimulate sort of a large area of, of skin, right, you're gonna your brain will tend to focus in on you know the the 
biggest stimulus yep. tend to start inhibiting the signal from surrounding areas. Well, and that's actually that's actually the way everything in the brain works. Yep. And so it's not just the skin. It's a model for the well, entire that brain. That was the whole von Beckeshi thing, right? right? And exactly. So, so I think it was 1961 Nobel Prize in physiology. Or it was in the 60s, that. yeah. And he discovered that, well, he, he opened up his discoveries for that in studying the cochlea, I think. Yeah. Right? And so, like, yeah, a lot of sensory systems work this way. They, they allow the brain to focus in on the main stimulus and then sort of suppress, kind of ignore, actively ignore the stuff around. Yeah, and if you really want to read more about lateral inhibition and how it was promoted by Von Beckeshi, it's a book called about $9 from Amazon. It's a paperback book, and you get you have to buy it used. Yeah, called and sensory, sensory inhibition. inhibition. Right. And, uh, but the cool thing is, you now, you can imagine, you know, it's pretty easy to, to do this on the skin, okay? And actually, the skin is the easiest way to do this. If you want to do this with vision, you got to you got to hit the back of the retina with very precise stimuli. And when, so, in other words, you take one eye and use some laser pointers. Right. Well, the somatotopic to, mapping of yeah. the skin makes this easy because you you know well this area will be next to this area on the brain you know pretty close. Yeah. And so you can you can control by just separating the spacing of your mechanical vibratory tips, like how close the sensation would be on the cortex. Right. An auditory cortex, you have to, you, you can get close to this, sort of, but not really, with, I think it's by different, with semantic. frequency. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's mapped to, by it's frequency. It's, mode, it's, it's called tonotopic. Yeah. But uh, Von Beckish, he did both visual things to prove lateral inhibition. He did auditory to prove, and he also did gustatory or taste oh, yeah, and taste. olfaction. And if you read about it, those were really cool experiments. It was, I mean, this was the 1950s. A guy was spritzing stuff on the tongue and, and mapping out how, you know, lateral inhibition between different taste receptors. Back in the day when you so could do experiments. You could do experiment, and he didn't have any IRB approval. <laughs> he just did what he thought was best. <laughs> just did it. So there's lots more to talk about. In particular, uh, this all we talked about was a little bit of lateral inhibition or feedback inhibition. But there's also feedback inhibition. As you can imagine, any electrical circuit that you've ever made up, what would be the other lines that you had drawn in here? So, oh, are you just talking about positive feedback? So, any in, in terms of a control, two modules. You take two control modules like this, and you're just saying, okay, what kinds of different control systems could we have? What kind of feedback and feed forward stuff would would there be? And you start imagining things like that. Yeah. And then you start looking for them, and you actually find them. You look, you find them, yeah. Well, this is one of those cases where, like, biology and and technology have gone kind of not lockstep, but you know, step and step and step. You know, the whole concept of homeostasis and keeping a control set value, like your temperature or your heart rate or something. Right. So you have things was called, adopted by engineers right? to to control aircraft, spacecraft. And then our models of those things, we bring them back to biology to understand the biology better, and we get insights in biology. So that's actually how it works. Yes, yeah. it's, it's it goes back. Yeah, and they forth. actually came came up with some neural networks that, mm -hmm. for controlling refrigeration and stuff long, long time ago. Oh yeah, absolutely. But and there's that, also a thing called you know <laughs> this is lateral inhibition is what we call it because it's mm -hmm. lateral. These two things are side by side. But you also have feedback inhibition. Mm -hmm. And if you don't even look at this module, you just look at the bottom one. And you can get feed forward inhibition. And you get feed forward inhibition. So from here, before you get to there, you get feed forward inhibition. So you yeah. also get feed forward excitation. Yeah. Feedback positive, positive excitation. Feedback, yeah. uh, basically, come up with uh, some type of control, and we'll see if we can find it. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. You know, control theory is pretty complicated, but. Uh, um, they use it for all kinds of like to, to make things work dynamically very fast. Like there's a lot of positive feedback in like the autoimmune system where you want to have a very rapid, very robust response. So a small signal like an invading bacterium or something will will elicit a very robust response very quickly. And there are there are physical systems that we want to have like that too. But then if we if you overdo it, you can make them unstable, right? It's like you know, like a little tiny input, and all of a sudden, well, the thing responds so strongly it blows itself apart, right? So, so now usually, in keeping with how our our uh, our random talkathons uh, hmm. always tie back into things, do you, did we ever tell them what the definition was? 
I know we had we, we had to look it up. Well, if you haven't looked it up by now, then you get negative points for curiosity. <laughs> if you didn't have to look it up because you can remember it, then you get positive points. Just send me an email. I'll adjust, <laughs> I'll adjust your grade. But let's go ahead and let's go ahead and throw that. Def- what was that definition? And angiodromia is the tendency of things to evolve into their opposites. So you know, helpful. University administrations tend to become <laughs> I would, anyone anyone Bueller, Bueller in the back. <laughs> I was going to go more scientific because you know, you know what I'm just bitter because I'm just nerdy yeah. and I get more excited about this. This lateral inhibition that we just talked about is it plays a key role in plasticity. It is a lot of people just think of plasticity, but it's that step by step sequence that you go mm-hmm. through. We change the sinusoid is what the what those stimuli look like from the brain gauge. And that plastic response that happens on this 120 millisecond time scale also happens on seconds, mm-hmm. minutes, mm-hmm. hours, days, on many different time scales. And it's, it's basically plasticity is a method of ad- adapting to your environment. And when you get maladaptive plasticity, yeah, yeah. that's when you get this. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> there you go. That's the time. There it goes the okay. long direction. So, we've been talking 30 minutes, about half the time, uh, just pure, unadulterated grumpiness, and about half the time we talk about science. So, that's not a bad ratio. Yeah, about right. Okay, so, so is that it for, <laughs> we'll, for today? We'll kill, we'll kill that for now. All right, we'll you see betcha. you later. Um, if you've got nothing better to do, and I mean nothing, uh, we'll be stay, back soon. Stay tuned. Yeah.